I want to start talking today about the hidden secret of God, God's hidden secret, secret hidden in Scripture. People love to hear secrets. They love to hear them. Hearing secrets, it produces a feeling. Feeling of, what is it, excitement, fascination? Even, even common, mundane secrets interest most people. Their ears itch to hear more. How much of daytime TV exists for no better reason than to reveal the secrets of other people's lives? Court TV, court TV evidence reveals people's hidden secrets, their hidden lives. What about the tell-all programs that dispel personal secrets to a listening world? They don't run short of viewers. Beyond secrets are mysteries. For today's purposes, by mystery, I mean a secret about the purpose and meaning of life. Spiritual mysteries, you might say. Mysteries exercise an intense power of attraction. People will flock to someone who promises to reveal the hidden mysteries of the universe, the mysteries of the unseen realm, the hidden dimensions of life. Our souls delight in spiritual secrets. Seeking hidden spiritual truth, it actually is a godly desire. It can be a godly desire. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus criticizes the two travelers on the road for, to Emmaus for not seeking and penetrating the hidden mysteries of Scripture. But here's the thing about hidden secrets. Being hidden and secret makes them hard to find. People can walk right by. They can walk right past and never notice. That's what happened to the secrets hidden in the Old Testament. People did look for those secrets. They, they looked for them in the Old Testament and realized, they realized some things God had promised that a great leader would come to his people whose title, the title of this great leader would be, was Messiah. Prophetic writings even revealed the approximate date of his arrival. For a hundred plus years around Jesus' time, new messiahs popped up among the Jews every decade or two. So people were expecting Messiah at Jesus' time. That much was on, the, on the, the surface of prophecy. But scratch below that surface and confusion reigned. About the only type of Messiah they did not expect was Jesus' type. He hung out with sinners. He had continual, continual conflict with the authority with every layer of the authority structure in Israel at the time, religious and secular. Then, most unbelievably, he died on a cross. Jewish messianic expectations had no room for a dead Messiah. That's the situation we find in our text from Luke chapter 24. Listen to how the, the two travelers describe Jesus, whom they think is now a dead Messiah. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers, they crucified him. But we had hoped, we had hoped 
He was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped. Do you hear the, the spiritual agony? Jesus disappointed? No, no, not disappointed. Jesus crushed their hopes by dying on the cross. But examine, go back and examine the content of their hope. That Jesus was going to do what? Redeem Israel. What was it that Jesus accomplished by dying on the cross? Our redemption. So Jesus did exactly what they expected. Still, they could not perceive it. Now that is hidden. Next, the two hapless disciples, they proceed to, the, to reject the resurrection. No wonder Jesus could stand right in front of them. Yet they don't recognize him. Jesus, I think actually he shows amazing restraint. He could have come down on them a lot harder than he did. He could have been a lot harsher than, how foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe what all the prophets have spoken. After Jesus revealed himself, when he broke bread with the two, they say, were not our hearts burning inside us? While well, he talked with us on the road and, and opened scripture to us. Their hearts burned as Jesus revealed the secrets of God to them. That is a godly reaction to learning divine, spiritual mysteries. How exciting to, to learn God's secret mysteries. Now, quick, can you tell me where to find God's secret mysteries? I just quoted it. When Jesus opened scriptures to them, that's where the secrets were. Remember, when you meet people who teach secret spiritual mysteries not found in the Bible, flee, run away. Trust only the Bible. God revealed his secrets. In this book, don't trust any other source. Learn the mystery of Jesus' death on the cross. He did not die to set us free from poverty. That's the prosperity gospel. He did not die to set us free politically. The dream of liberation theology. Jesus did not even die to set us free medically from diseases like coronavirus. Those represent false hopes, and they will eventually all be disappointed. Instead, Jesus died to make us holy, pure, in order to free us from the power of sin. Jesus died to redeem his people. To redeem his people from their sins. Now, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they had hope for a warrior Messiah. That's one of the, the false hopes, false expectations that we find in Luke chapter 24. They had hoped for a warrior Messiah who would throw off the chains of Roman occupation. Now, before we criticize them for their spiritual blindness, we need to check ourselves, our own hopes and expectations. Do we long for false messiahs just like they did? A financial messiah who will lead us to wealth. A medical Messiah who will deliver us from sickness. A relationship Messiah who will match us with true love. Friends, modern messianic expectations can be just as deceiving as ancient ones. 
Only in retrospect could people see and appreciate the, the beautiful tapestry of prophecy that God had woven together in his word. Only after the cross and resurrection did the full meaning of Jesus' life become apparent to his followers. You see, we need to read backwards from New Testament to Old if we desire to understand the full depth of compassion and grace that God foretold would come through Jesus. Jesus did not suffer and die to make us successful or to make us feel good about ourselves. Rather, Jesus died to make us holy and pure. Jesus died to make us ready to prepare us for eternal life with the most holy God. To recognize that, start with the cross and resurrection, then turn the pages backwards to the Old Testament. Turn backwards and examine the Old Testament from the New. Looking at the God who loves us all the way to his death on the cross. Our, our spiritual eyes adjust as if to a new light. We, our eyes adjust so we can see the depths of grace and mercy. Depths we never even imagined. That is how we learn the hidden mysteries of the Bible. If we don't know scripture, Jesus cannot open the Bible to our minds. He can't open up its inner meaning if we don't even know its surface meaning. So study scripture, study the Bible, learn. Let the Holy Spirit teach you to, to, to look at the world around you through the lens of this book. Look at the world around you through the Bible. Examine events that occur in our lives from a God's eye point of view. That is what the Bible reveals to us. A God's eye point of view. All told, the New Testament quotes hundreds of Old Testament texts that clearly point to Jesus. But all those verses together, you add them all up, they probably don't amount to more than a small percentage of the Old Testament. The Old Testament's a big book. When Jesus opened the disciples' minds to understand the scriptures, and of course, by scriptures, that means the Old Testament. When Jesus opened their minds to understand scripture, the vast majority of those verses are our hidden references to Jesus. Hidden references like our, our three passages from Isaiah that we read today. In combination, those three passages, they reveal hidden prophetic truths about Jesus. These are some of the hidden secrets of the Bible. Let's start with the first two verses of Isaiah chapter 9 that we read. In the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles. Okay, verse 1 introduces a future prophecy, something or someone from Galilee will be honored by God because for this reason, verse 2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. This light it is so brilliant, it evaporates the darkness of death. Now that is a bright light. And friends, only the light of God is that bright. Bright enough to outshine the darkness of death. You see, the light shines, but the darkness could not overcome it. In verse 6, that famous Christmas verse the identity of that light is made clearer. 
we're advancing this concept of light. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Somehow, in a, a human child, we will find the mighty God whose light outshines the darkness of death. We're already in Jesus territory, aren't we? Now let's add our verses, our two verses from Isaiah chapter 42. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and take you and make you a, to, I will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. God promises, I personally and directly called my servant. The servant of this prophecy advances the theme of, of light versus darkness. His light isn't for the Jewish people alone, but for the, the whole world, the Gentiles. Somehow the light of this servant, it will redeem. It will set free people imprisoned by darkness. Now, that's sort of an odd statement, right? Imprisoned, not by walls, but by darkness. Imprisoned by darkness, the darkness associated with death. Chapter 42 adds to the concepts of light and dark. God states his purpose to create a righteous servant. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. This righteous servant whom God will make into a covenant for the people, the Jews, and a light for the Gentiles. This, this you that we're talking about, this servant, sounds a little bit like that child who was the light for the Gentiles back in Isaiah chapter 9. But what about the... This cryptic notion that a person, a person can become God's covenant. In the past, in the Old Testament, God had made covenants. God's past covenants involve some type of human actions. For example, Abraham or Moses and the people of Israel at Mount Sinai. God's past covenants involved human actions and animal sacrifices. But here, a person is the covenant. Strange. We'll come back to that. The prophecy in Isaiah 49 now, moving on to Isaiah 49, the prophecy in Isaiah 49 draws these themes together. The Lord says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to be to restore Israel. It's a, a small, too small a thing for you, my servant, to restore Israel. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says. In the day of salvation, I will help you. I will make you to be a covenant for the people. Now, there's a lot going on here. Again, some mysterious servant of the Lord is the, the figure that the prophecy points towards. This servant will restore Israel and be a light for the Gentiles. Now, we, we've seen that before. The purpose of God's work, though, gets expanded. The servant as God's instrument, will bring salvation, new idea here, salvation, the promised salvation, will not just be for Israel, but extends to the ends of the earth. And once again, the prophecy makes a strange reference to God's servant being made a covenant for his people. 
Now, time to summarize what we've learned from these three prophecies, what the Isaiah teaches us in these three cases. One, God's light will come from Galilee. That was the first verse that we read. That light will outshine darkness. We saw that three times. It will outshine the darkness of death in order, third, to redeem God's people and all nations. God's salvation will extend to the ends of the earth, will not be confined anywhere. So fifth, creating the, this salvation to the ends of the earth creates for, the, the, for God a holy and righteous people who, finally, sixth, will be united with God through a covenant that is somehow in this servant who is their Redeemer and their Savior. So, Isaiah's prophecies present us with a person, a servant, who is in himself the light that outshines death, originating from Galilee, coming into the world as a child for the salvation, for salvation that extends to the ends of the earth for the whole world, and this servant will become the covenant of God. Now, friends, this points directly at Jesus, who at his last supper took the cup, took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Finally, at the end of his life, his last meal, Jesus resolves the cryptic notion of a person becoming a covenant. Jesus read his fate from the pattern he found in the Old Testament. He saw a clear vision of the work Messiah was, was to accomplish in his scripture, our Old Testament. Yet this vision, though clear to the mind of God, was not recognized on earth, not at all, not until Jesus opened the minds of his disciples to understand what was written about himself in the Old Testament. In today's conclusion, I want to return to a word that I used at the beginning of this message. The word is mystery. Paul uses this word to describe Jesus several times. For instance, in the passage from Colossians chapters 1 and 2 that we use today in our call to worship. Paul wrote about the mystery hidden for the ages, now revealed. Listen and learn the hidden secret of God, the glory of this mystery, which is the mystery of God, which is, what is it? It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. God's secret, secret mystery is Jesus. The person, Jesus of Nazareth from Galilee, whose body hung on a cross, becoming the new covenant that God uses to save and to unite all of his people. At Jesus' last meal with his disciples, he instituted the sacrament of his body and blood, uniting us to the forgiveness of God that the prophets had foretold over and over again. And now Jesus has fully accomplished our forgiveness, God's mercy for us. A couple of sentences later in Colossians chapter 2, Paul adds, God's mystery, he repeats, which is, God's mystery is what? It is Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Friends, during our, in, our enforced inactivity from the, by the coronavirus lockdown, will you pursue the mystery of God? Do you desire to know the secret wisdom 
the hidden secrets of the Bible? If you do, then pursue Jesus Christ. He is the mystery fully revealed. Now, final point. We cannot cut off the hidden mystery of God from the person and the body of Jesus. That would uproot the mystery from its soil, and an uprooted plant will die in your hand. To separate the secrets of God from Jesus, from Jesus and the Bible, results in false spiritual knowledge that will lead us away from God. Seek Christ alone through Scripture alone. If you desire to discover God's hidden secrets, that's where you'll find them. Jesus, he never referred to any other source of divine revelation. Jesus didn't quote Buddha, Socrates, or any spiritual teacher outside the Bible, and he did not intend for us to either. We don't need to go searching the world for God's secrets and mysteries. Friends, the Bible contains them all. In fact, if we do look elsewhere, Jesus will go walking by us and we will not recognize him. We'll never know it because he cannot be found anywhere else. Find this mystery of God in the text of Scripture and in the sacrament of Jesus' body and blood. I give Jesus the, the last word about the mystery of his life and death on earth. In Luke chapter 24, towards the end of our reading, Jesus reveals the, the core of his mission, the mission that he read for himself out of the Old Testament from the pages of the Old Testament, Jesus said to his disciples, this is what is written, that is, in the Old Testament, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. May we, like Jesus' first disciples, be faithful witnesses to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.